So at some point you had a kind of a brainwave or something came to you about morphic resonance, and that was the catalyst for writing your first book, the first edition, and New yes. Science of Life. You want to explain how that came about and how you developed the theory? Well, when I uh, finished at Harvard studying philosophy and history of science, I went back to Cambridge to do a PhD. And I'd originally planned to work on um, animals, but then I realised if I worked with animals, I'd spend the rest of my career killing and cutting up animals, and I just didn't want to do that. So I switched to plants, which I was also very interested in. And I worked on plant development, how plants grow and develop. Um, I worked on how the plant hormone auxin, uh, it's one of the main plant hormones, so um, how that's made in plants and also how it's transported around the plant. Um, and then as the more I thought about it, the more I realised that understanding how this hormone's made and transported, which we did understand quite a lot about, um, doesn't really explain very much because the same hormone is made and transported in leaves and shoots and flowers uh, and roots. And the same hormone is made and transported around in roses and cabbages and palm trees and bamboos and dandelions. And uh, in a way, this explained too much. It didn't explain why flowers were different from leaves, and it didn't explain why dandelions were different from palm trees, um, because um, the hormone's the same in all these cases. So I got interested in how biological form is shaped. What is the plan that it, it enables an organism to develop, a flower, a leaf, a dandelion, a palm tree? And there was a concept already around in biology called morphogenetic fields, which is form-shaping fields. Morphe means form, genesis means coming into being. Morphogenesis is the coming into being of form. And the idea that had been around since the 1920s was that organisms had these invisible fields that acted as plans, shaping organisms. So it's, um, the, the fields were what shaped the organism, gave it its form, organized the way the cells developed and so forth. Um, like an invisible mould or plan. I thought this was a, an essential idea. We needed something like this. And when I thought about these fields, I realised that they'd have to be inherited. They couldn't be inside the genes, because genes are just chemicals that code for proteins. So I wrestled with the idea of how they inherited and came up with the uh, idea of morphic resonance, uh, a kind of memory based on a resonance across time. So a dandelion inherits its dandelion fields by resonating with past dandelions. Um, and this involved a, a new kind of action across space and time, a resonance of form. So that idea I came up with when I was uh, working at Cambridge, where I was a fellow of Clare College, and I was also at the time a research fellow of the Royal Society. Um, and I realised that this was going to be controversial, and I wasn't sure if it made sense or not. So I spent a lot of time discussing it with people. Um, then I took a job in India working in an international agricultural research institute on plant growth, on tropical crops. And I spent another four or five years thinking about this. Um, and it made more and more sense the more I thought about it, until I finally decided to write about it in my book, A New Science of Life. Uh, which I did uh, originally in India. I wrote the book in India. Because you were in India for about six years, I think, weren't you? Yes, well, seven altogether. <coughs> I, was, I worked at this institute for about five years, ICRASET, the International Crops Research Institute for the Semi-Arid Tropics in Hyderabad. And then I wrote the book in the ashram of Father Bede Griffiths, who was an English Benedictine who lived in an ashram in South India, a Christian ashram very simply, in a simple community on the bank of a sacred river. So I, I needed somewhere to think and write. He invited me to stay at this ashram, and I had a lovely time living there and writing the first draft of my book, A New Science of Life. And that's the book that's just been reissued again in a completely updated version. So what does it cover, then, A New Science of Life? What would people who are going to buy the book, what they, what they actually learn? Well, it starts by dealing with the unsolved problems of biology. 
what is it that biology hasn't solved? And there's a lot of things it hasn't solved. One is how form develops in animals and plants. Another is um, how consciousness works. Another is the problems of parapsychology. It simply can't grapple with things like telepathy. It, uh, that's why they are kind of taboo within science at the moment. Um, and the nature of evolution, the inheritance of instincts, all of these are unsolved problems. And what I suggest in the book is that the idea of morphogenetic fields, form-shaping fields, uh, and morphic resonance, an inherited memory, a collective memory that each species has, each individual draws upon and contributes to the collective memory of the species. I suggest that these are the way that organisms work, inherit their behaviour. Um, this plays a huge part in evolution. And I try and explain how the fields work, what morphic resonance involves, how it gives us a completely different perspective on the way life works, one which is consistent with evolution. It's part of a holistic picture of life, and which points, I think, to what the book's called, A New Science of Life. Um, so that's what people will find if they read the book. Um, and it's written for general readers. It's, it's slightly technical. I mean, it's not very technical, but uh, and I did my best to make it completely comprehensible, but it would be probably easier for people to read if they'd done GCSE in science or possibly even A-level biology, but even without that, uh, it's still um, something that most people can follow. I think one of the things that intrigued me was there's a certain parallel between the morphic fields and the way the mind works insofar as you talk about the more experienced, let's say, or a more evolving the species is, then the stronger that gets over time. And it's the same with our human mind. The more we have a certain thought process, the stronger that thought process gets in the mind. Yes, well, I, the, the, it's really a theory of habit. It says that nature is hab habitual. And in my book, The Presence of the Past, I develop this idea much further and apply it to more to the mind and social organisation. And I think that our minds are also based on habits, habits of thought, habits of behaviour, um, and that those are inherited by morphic resonance as well. So I started off applying this theory just to the development of plants and animals, to embryology, to the growth of plants, and to chemistry, to crystals, because it applies to chemistry as well. And then I later came to apply it to the mind and to animal behaviour, and a lot of my later work has been concerned with the nature of the mind and with animal behaviour. Essentially a field theory of the mind that says that the same kinds of fields that shape the growth of embryos also underlie the activity of the nervous system, organise the behaviour of animals, the activity of the brain. And those too have habits built in uh, which are inherited by morphic resonance. So when a spider, for example, knows how to spin a web without ever being taught, it's an instinctive ability that young spiders have, um, they just spin a web straight off. Um, this is like a habit of the species, part of a collective memory that they're drawing upon. It's inherited by morphic resonance. It's not coded in the genes. Um, <coughs> at the moment, most people assume that all inheritance is genetic, that somehow all these abilities are somehow squeezed inside the chemicals of DNA and that there's a kind of program or plan for the organism in the genes. I don't think that's true at all. I think the genes simply do what we know they do. They code for proteins. Um, they don't code for patterns of behavior. <coughs> so, um, anyway, this is how I, I extend this idea of morphic resonance into animal behaviour and into psychology and the nature of the mind. Because you, I've got a great part of your, of your books here, and you do actually have a book, Dogs That Know When Their Owners Are Coming Home, which I think that got a very enthusiastic response, didn't it? Because there was a lot of people that could actually identify with that. 